Have you ever wondered what separates average from expert intubators? Today, you will see me getting schooled by an absolute master of hyperangulated video laryngoscopy, Dr. Nicholas Crimes, inventor of the Vortex approach, co-founder of the Safe Airway Society, and a bunch of other expert airway accolades to his name. I love getting schooled by experts, and what you'll see is Nick turning a 20-second intubation procedure into an excruciating <laughs> 10 minutes of exquisitely fine detail that airway nerds like me crave and that will help you if you train these micro skills. Doesn't matter if you're using hyperangulated video laryngoscopy routinely or as a backup for your difficult airways, I'm sure you will get something from this. And despite 32 years of intubating, I really don't use hyperangulated blades very often at all. So if you stick around, you will see how one of the world's foremost airway experts transforms my approach to hyperangulated video laryngoscopy forever. So, when I think about laryngoscopy, whether it's direct, indirect, MAC, hyperangulated, I think of it in terms of view, delivery, passage. If you think about um, Keith Greenland's primary, secondary curve, the, the, the primary curve when you're using a MAC blade, getting a view is, the primary curve is negotiated mechanically. You, you use the MAC blade to flatten out that curve. The result is, if you've got a view, You've got line, if you've got line of sight, you've got line of passage. So yeah. all the skill is in getting a view. And after that, apart from yeah. some minor tweaks, usually delivering the tube's okay. Mm -hmm. Hyperangular is the complete opposite. It overcomes the primary curve technologically, but the curve is still there. And whilst you've got a great view up there in two dimensions, you often don't appreciate that that curve is still there and that you need to negotiate it. So, if hyperangulated, getting a view is easy. You've got to know how to get the right view, um, but delivery and passage is the whole the whole skill. So, in terms of getting a view, if you imagine that's the trachea, mm -hmm. and they're they're the tracheal rings, oh, yeah. the temptation is to put the hyperangular blade in and get that view. Yeah. The characteristics of which are that the view is that the larynx is filling the screen. Um, that it's going to be a grade one view, and that between the cords you're seeing tracheal rings. Yeah. I like the way your finger gives it the fleshy colour. <laughs> the um, what the problem with that view is one: if you're going to put your tube in now, you can't see where your tube is to get it towards the to get it to the glottis. Mm -hmm. If you do, what you don't appreciate is the blade's actually obstructing the glottis, they're stopping you getting your tube in. Right. And third thing is that even if you manage to get your tube under there, you're coming up like this yeah. with what can almost be a 90 degree angle yeah. you're going to ne negotiate, which you don't necessarily appreciate when you're seeing it in two dimensions on the screen. Yeah. So if you have that sort of view, to correct it, what you want to do is withdraw the blade, rotate the blade and lift the blade. And what you have now is a nice wide angle view. Mm -hmm. um, you are, and, and now you're looking, your, your glottis is often in the top half of the screen, but I don't think that's such a major issue. Okay. Um, and you're, you're still looking towards the anterior wall of the trachea, but you're looking much yes, more so. down the long axis of the trachea. Yeah. So that's the view you want. Yeah. That, that is correcting for it. In terms of getting that view, yeah. you've probably often heard people say with hyperangulated, get a compromised view, mm -hmm. get a grade yeah, two view. Yeah, I, I think that it's ludicrous to have a device, the whole, the whole point of which is to give you a great view and then deliberately screw it up. The reason that comes about is I think people teach how to get the view by inserting the blade and, and just rotating it. Mm -hmm. And if you just rotate it and you rotate it to get a grade one view, then you end up with that view with all the, the attendant problems with it. But if you rotate until you get a grade two view and then you lift the blade towards the ceiling, so you're not putting the tip of the blade in the molecular like you might with a Mac blade, you're just rotating until you get about a grade two view and then you lift, so the tip of the blade might be behind the tongue, mm. but by lifting the tongue up, you then lift some of these structures and you get a grade one view. So now you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting a grade one view, but you've still got that wide angle view. So I think where, where this has arisen is if people are only teaching this rotational movement, mm -hmm. the only way to get the axes aligned and get that wide angle view is to have a compromised view, but that additional lifting gives you both. Okay. And that was, that was one of the things that Richard Cooper told me in that sort of five minutes that changed my life. Um, so that's, that's the view. The, 
in terms of delivery, um, you'll hear people delight, debate starlets versus bougies. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's the wrong issue. I think that the issue is an introducer with a stable curb in it versus an introducer that is straight that you've made bent and then given time is unfurling and working against you. Most of my anaesthetic colleagues who use hyperangulated will do this and then this will gradually unfurl. And again, it's that problem I was saying of the most dangerous thing about airway management is that it's so safe is that most of the way you can get away with bad process and still get a good outcome. But the problem is it's not a robust technique. You, you've got a situation where um, this will work for, I, I want a technique that's gonna work for the most challenging, challenging airways, not the least challenging. And the harder it gets and the longer I take, the more opportunity this has to work against me and move away from where I'm trying to deliver the tube. So if, if you use one of those flex tip bougies with a fixed curve in it, I think, that's fine, you can use a, use a bougie. I like the stilet because it's, I don't want to get dependent on a, a particular bit of kit that I might not have as I move around to different places. Um, and even if you don't have these, which most places do, with a malleable stilet, you can make this and do the same thing. So in terms of preparing the tube, I like to do a couple of things. The first is to lubricate the stilet to lubricate the top of the blade because um, particularly patients have been on high flow and stuff if they're dry because you're not getting into that uh, underneath the tongue where there's secretion still it just sticks and it won't go and the final thing I do to prepare is I get a syringe and I inflate the cuff and then you grab it through the packet so I'm not manipulating at all but deflate the cuff so that I put all that redundant cuff on the right side of the tube so that the side my camera is looking down is not going to have that redundant cuff coming out obstructing the view or flaring up and making everything distal to it dark. That's interesting. So then I'm going to load my lubricated stilet onto the tube. So we've done rotate and lift to get our wide angle grade one view. I think when you do MAC blade laryngoscopy what you tend to do is create a big space and then you sort of put the tube in towards the back of the pharynx and you can just head down the trachea. If you do that with this so that your tube is, your glottis is up here but your tube is coming into the bottom of the screen, mm -hmm. to correct for that what you'll often find you're doing is um, your instinct is to say, well, the tube, the tube's yeah. down there, I'm going to yeah. just do Angle this it. sort of yeah. like that. And on here, it looks great. It looks yeah. like you're bringing here, but what you don't appreciate again is that you're on this oh, extreme yeah. angle yeah. and you can't get it to go in. And I think that's where you yeah. get that sort of problem from the video this morning. Mm -hmm. um, again, the second thing Richard showed me that was really important was when you get to there, it's not an intuitive movement, but again, rather than trying to do that, is to just lift this arm towards the ceiling. And now you bring it up into the same plane as the glottis. Mm -hmm. But now when you come in, you're coming in close to the axis of the trachea. You're still, you're still slightly off axis, but you're much better aligned. Um, so I think that the thing is trying to, when you put the blade in, is you hold the, hold the tube at the top, so not like a pencil like you would normally for a Mac blade. Hold it at the top so you can control this. Hug the blade. The blade is going to the glottis, so if you follow the blade, you should end up at the glottis. Put enough of the tip of the tube in that you can sort of dock the tube and it will hold itself in place. So we've now delivered the tube to the cord. So we're gonna ideally hug the blade, but if we find ourselves coming to the bottom of the screen, yeah. rather than doing that, we're gonna do that. Yep. Um, so that's view delivery. The next thing is passage. So the, now the problem we've, we've got here, because of that rigid stilet, that tube, the tra trachea is heading down into the chest. You can't advance that anymore because the, the stilet wants to go up. So you need to pull the stilet back far enough that you get enough flexibility that, that the tip of the tube can start to negotiate the secondary right. curve, yeah. but not so much that it starts to buckle yeah. above and won't okay. feed in, particularly yeah. as it's been, you know, sitting right. there and start to get warm to body temperature, yeah. they, can, they can soften up. Or if you're using a reinforced tube for much for some okay. reason, that becomes a, yeah. a a problem also. So my experience is finding that sweet spot right. in how far to put it back. Yeah. That was the bit that took longest, working out how far to put it back. So yeah. pull it back. So I usually sort of say pull it back an inch, inch and a half. Yeah. 
and if it won't advance pull it back a bit more if you see it start to buckle push it in and you gradually get a feel for that reason I don't encourage certainly initially an assistant pulling the tube because you can't sort of describe describe what you want and you can't learn from it once you had whole teams that all got it you could probably do it as a, as a, a two-person approach so delivery is pop the tube and then once I've popped it, I bring my hand around. So I was holding the tube and manipulating the stilette. I now bring my hand around to hold the stilette so that I can slide really? the tube off until oh. it's at an appropriate depth. Mm -hmm. And then I grab the tube, because again, I'm often working with people of very, very mm -hmm. experienced. I'm not in a sort of highly trained team like you are here. Um, I grab the tube there and I pull that out myself forward mm -hmm. so, so I can control all that. So I'll just run you through it on the on the mannequin and then you can yeah. have a go. So um, is someone just able to hold the, the mannequin down for me. So tongue in the midline on top of uh, sorry, blade in the midline on top of the tongue, rotating until I get a grade two view, lifting to get a grade one view, mm -hmm. holding the, the tube from the top hugging the blade and coming down, following the blade down into the glottis, docking the tube in the glottis, bringing my hand around, sliding, oh, sorry, popping the stilette up a bit. So you can see the tip of the stilette there. And now coming up to slide that off. And of course, for the first time all day, it's not gonna go off. So what I would say is come, come back. No, I think I'm not in far enough is the problem there. Hang on, let me just come back again. So come in there. Dock the tube, pull that back, slide that off, bring it back up here, cup up, watch the cup up, pull the tube out, CO2, green zone, Yeah, we're done. Have a go. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do a bit of lube on the side there, and we're going to lube on the tongue side of the laryngoscope blade. Pop that on. Trusty assistant holding the camera. Okay, so midline, you get a point to epiglottis. By the time, whoops. By the time round, into the left around to get my brain to you, then you lift. And then follow. So holding, holding a tube at the top? Oh, holding the top, yeah. So the blade. Holding the blade, so tip in, then gonna pop. Yep. The stylet an inch or so back. Inch and a half. Advance the tube. Grab there. Gonna pull this by rotating out. Inflate yeah. cuff. And cuff radiation. Sustain the connect the bag. Sustain the exhaled carbon dioxide. Excellent. Beautiful. Thanks. Top tips. Thank you, Nick. That's great. <laughs>